Father, we do thank you, God, for your wonderful grace and your goodness. Lord, for the opportunity we have, Lord, to stand here this morning, God, and do our best by the help of the Lord to rightly divide the word of truth. And God, I can do nothing without thee. I understand, God, what I am and who I am. And Lord, I understand, Father, that I'm just a sinner saved by the grace of God. But Lord, you've called me to preach your word, and I pray, God, that Lord, through your grace, God, that you'd help us today. Lord, I pray right now, Father, that the Spirit of God would speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray, God, as we go on and on in time, Father, as the days go on, and God, we get that much closer to the coming of the Lord. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take the Word of God, that it might comfort us. God, in our time of distress, in our time of need, God, we just pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, this morning. Again, bless the Word of God. May all we say be to thy glory, and God, may we say nothing contrary to thy will. But again, I pray, Father, move me aside, and may the Spirit of God take over in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach to you a message this morning. The title of it is Lost and Found, and it's the story of Mephibosheth. Lost and Found, the story of Mephibosheth. As I read through the Word of God and I come across passages of Scripture that the Lord speaks to my heart about, and oft times God will lead me to preach a message on the subject. And I don't know that I've ever preached on this passage of Scripture. I don't know how in all my years of preaching that I could have missed this, and I probably not, I just don't remember. But it jumped out at me particularly this week as I was reading again in the book of 2 Samuel. And this story of Mephibosheth is is such a great story of the grace of God. Now we first learn of Mephibosheth over in chapter number 4, and I'm going to read four verses here. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captain of bands, and the name of the and the name of the one was Bahana, and the name of the other Rechab, and the sons of Remon and Barathite, and of the children of Benjamin, for Beroth also was reckoned to Benjamin. And the Barathites fled to get him, and were sojourners there until this day. And Jonathan Saul's son had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Now this story in itself is a great story. Uh, Saul's son, and the, you know the the story is that Saul is dead, Jonathan is dead, but he has a son left named Mephibosheth. Now Mephibosheth becomes lame upon his feet because as they are fleeing uh, to save their lives, the nurse that was taking care of Mephibosheth because he had no family, and because uh, you know because that she was. Uh, trying to take care of him. Apparently, she grabbed him and and took off with him. Now, somewhere along the way, in their haste to flee and to get away, he fell. And apparently, he must have broken both of his legs or both of his feet. And they never healed properly. So five years old, Mephibosheth, uh, is known as the lame man. He's known as the lame boy. Now, he did marry and he did have children, uh, but Mephibosheth is basically crippled living down in the land of Lodabar. Now, you think of this, Lodabar is, is means a place without a pasture, a place without any use, a desert place, No, nothing good down in Lodabar. And then we know that Mephibosheth's name, it means shame. So we see a man of shame down in a place called Lodabar. 
uh, which is a, a place without pastor. This is not a real good picture for a young boy, is it? But we're going to see here about the grace of God and how that God's grace being sufficient, how that God takes all of that and turns it into something good. Mephibosheth was lost man down in Lodabar because nobody knew about him. David did not know about him because he inquired. We're going to read that in a minute. He inquired of him. David didn't know anything about him. So he was, he was a lost uh, boy down in Lodabar and uh, he was the only son of Jonathan that was left alive. He didn't have much to live for. And he was hiding from David. Now why would he be hiding from David? Because in those days when a king took over, he, he purged the land of the, of the relatives of the king that preceded him. Now, he did that. He tried to get rid of all of them, run them off or kill them, so that they would never be a, a threat to his kingship. And so as Mephibosheth was hiding down there trying to get away and trying to stay away from David, David had something different in his heart. Now, turn over with us back to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. And this story continues on because of David's love for Jonathan. Jonathan had already died. Saul had already died, and, uh, but David remembered his covenant with Jonathan and he remembered that they would, uh, you know, keep each other's seed alive, that they would uh, not destroy one another. And he had a great love for Jonathan. There was a, a brotherly love there that exceeded uh, the love of women even, the Bible says, because they had a great kinship and a great friendship one with another. So because of Jonathan's and David's love, Jonathan, uh, David sought out the lost son Mephibosheth that he might show him some kindness. Now again, Mephibosheth doesn't know anything about this. Remember, he is lost down in Lodabar, hiding from David. Verse number 9, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Is there nobody left of the house of Saul that I can show kindness upon them for my friend Jonathan? Surely there's someone down there that, that is still alive that is, a, that is of the kinship that I might show them some grace and show them some mercy and show them some kindness and love. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. The king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. Now he said, Jonathan's got a son, but he's lame on his feet. He's, he's uh, nothing that you, you know that you can think good of, nothing uh, that you would want in your palace, but he has a son, and he is uh, down in Lodabar. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mechar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mechar, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. So David sent down there. He said, well, if there's someone down there, I'm going to go get him. Now, Mephibosheth does not understand, does not know why David's coming after him. He is in fear of his life. And he does not know why David is coming after him. But he sent him down there to fetch him. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he, had, and he answered, Behold thy servant. So here we see this little crippled man. I can pick, listen, everybody get everything out of your mind in just a minute. Close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now, you get in your mind a picture of this little crippled man, Mephibosheth. You think about that, 
And you think about him, probably didn't have nice clothes on, probably was tattered and uh, worn, and, and he probably had the best he had on, but it probably wasn't real nice. And there he is, this little man, standing before the great King David, and David speaking with him. The king of the land was speaking to little Mephibosheth. Now, you got that in your mind? Everybody look like that. Now, you see this little crippled man standing before the king, frightened and scared, and, and he says to him, as he fell on his face, and he did reverence to him, and David said, Mephibosheth, what he said to him was, Behold, thy servant, I'm here. What do you want from me? What can I do? I am here as your servant, little Mephibosheth, little crippled man. And evidently David sensed the fear that was in Mephibosheth, and he saw that maybe he was there prostrate before him, trembling, and he told him, he said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now, the Bible says that Saul, being his father, in those days the grandfather, the grandparents were also considered, you know, it was, it was proper to call them father also. So there's no contradiction here. That was just the, the time and the way people looked at one another. And he said, I'm going to restore to you, little crippled man now, you got him in your mind? little crippled man, and I'm just about imagining it as he walked before the king. And there a little crippled man looked up at David and he laid himself prostrate before David. And he said, lay down there. David said, don't be worried. Don't fear. I'm not going to harm you. I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan's sake. Maybe little Mephibosheth climbed back up to his feet. Maybe he stood there. Maybe he laid there. And, Saul, and David looked at him and said, I'm going to restore everything that your father Saul had. I'm going to make it yours again. Oh, my goodness. What must have went through his mind when little Mephibosheth heard from the king of the land? I mean, the king over all the land, King David, and in his palace and all the niceties and all the finest things of life. David had, there was that little crippled man and the king telling him, I'm going to give you back everything that you saw your father had. I'm going to give it back to you. All the land, all the property, everything that you, uh, that you could not ever imagine having, I'm going to bestow upon you by kindness, Mephibosheth. I'm going to give it all to you. And he bowed himself, Mephibosheth, and he uh, verse 7, And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And what else is he going to do? And he says to him again, He says, And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Little Mephibosheth. Little boy didn't have nothing. Or young man by then didn't have anything, didn't own anything. And because of his lameness, couldn't do a lot to help himself. Had to have people helping him all the time and, and had nothing. But a king said, here's the king coming and said, Mephibosheth, because of your father, because of Jonathan and our friendship, I'm going to restore upon you. I'm going to bestow upon you some kindness for Jonathan's sake. I'm going to give you all that, you, that Saul ever had. I'm going to give it back to you. And guess what, Mephibosheth? You're going to get to sit down at my table every day and eat what I eat. Oh, my. What a blessing. What a thought to think that this little crippled boy that a few days before had no idea that he was going to be this way and maybe a few days before was afraid for his life that King David might find him and somehow take vengeance on him. And when they come to get him, no doubt Mephibosheth thought, well, David's come, he's found me, and I'm going to die because of, of all that my father has done. I'm going to die, and they're going to do away with me. I'm the only one left, and I'm the kin, and I'm, you know, I, I've got, I've got a, a way to get to the throne, and David's going to kill me. But when he gets before the king, when he gets before the king, the king says, you've got all that's all that. And every day at breakfast time, 
you sitting at my table. Every day at lunchtime, you're sitting at my table. Every day at supper time, you're sitting at my table. Till the day you die, Mephibosheth, you're sitting at my table. All the kindness and all the love that David had for this little crippled man. Now, Mephibosheth doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know what to think. He don't know what to do. Verse 8, and he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? That thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am. That's what he thought of himself. That's what Mephibosheth thought of himself before the king. Who am I that you would look upon me? Friend, I want to tell you something today. That Jesus saved my wretched soul. And I thought, who am I that a king of heaven should look upon this sinner, should look upon this crippled boy, this lame boy such as me, dead in trespasses and sin. And I thought, who am I that the king would bestow such goodness upon me in my lost condition, but guess what he did? Why? Because he wanted to show me some kindness. Amen. For who? Jesus saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Thou, thou therefore and thy son. And again, verse 9. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given to thy master's son all that pertains to Saul and to all the house. Now he calls the servant up and says, I'm going to give him everything. Told him just exactly what he told Mephibosheth. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruit, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. So he laid upon Ziba and his sons and his servants to till all the land that he had just given back to Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth couldn't do it. He, he had not the resources to do it. But Ziba had all the resources and all the servants to take to till that land. And half of that went to Mephibosheth and the other half came to him. So the better they did, the better uh, they did for their ser or, or for Mephibosheth, the better they did for themselves. So we see that this is a trickle-down effect, so to speak, of the blessing of another. So we, we see here, Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. And Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. said, I'm going to treat him just like one of my own sons. Now you're talking about a love. He never knew the boy until he'd asked about him, until he'd inquired about him just a few minutes ago. He didn't know that Mephibosheth existed. But in a few short days, <coughs> because of Jonathan, he has developed a great love for Mephibosheth and he says, he's going to eat at my table. I'm going to treat him just like one of mine. Amen. Oh, friend, do you see the connection here between God the Father in heaven that loved you and I so much that he'll treat us just like the Son of God. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to, oh, thank God. Today we can eat at the table of God three meals a day if we want to, have all the snacks we want. But one day in heaven, friend, we're going to remain with him for eternity and eat at his table. Hallelujah. He's going to treat us just like he does Jesus. Hallelujah. Why? Because of Jesus, but for Christ's sake, he's going to treat us just like his son because we are the sons of God by Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us so. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelled in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. For he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Now, friend, I see a great picture of grace here. As David had grace, showed grace to Mephibosheth. I see here, hallelujah, how God in heaven, through his son, shows me much grace. I'm going to give you three things real quick and then we'll go as the Lord will lead us. First of all, as we see in this wonderful story of God's grace, 
You and I were down in Lodabar. You and I, number one, were lost without hope living down in the land of Lodabar. We were down there and we were in shame because of our wretchedness, because of our sin. We were crippled by sin. We were crippled also by a fall. You know what fall that crippled us is the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden. When he fell, it crippled mankind for all eternity. It crippled us and all we were were crippled. All we are are sinners saved by the grace of God if you are saved. But we're just crippled and we can't do anything for God. We can't get to God. But oh, thank God, friend, God can get to us. Amen? So we see ourselves as crippled down in the land of Lodabar, down in a, pa a place of no hope, down in a place of no pasture, down in a place where we ourselves are helpless without a Savior and without hope. Doomed for a life of failure, doomed for a life of destruction, and finally doomed for eternity in hell. There you are, and there I am. But somebody loved us. Somebody wanted to show us some kindness for Christ's sake. We had no future, but a future. Can you, can you imagine Mephibosheth's life before all this took place? Now, he was old enough to have a son. So he got married and had a son. But can you imagine his life as a cripple in those days? They, they weren't much use to anybody. They couldn't do anything. Somebody had to continuously help. The only way he had much of making a living was by begging and depending upon others. And there's Mephibosheth, and he don't know what to do, and he don't know how to do anything, and yet he's going through life, and no doubt his life is a life of despair. What am I going to do? How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to take myself? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen the next day? What's going to happen years to come? Well, how are my children going to grow up? So he was living a life of despair. But then David come on. You and I are living in that same condition, living a life of despair. You know what's, about, what's wrong with lost people today? They're living a life of despair. That's why they turn to everything they can to give them some joy and to give them some happiness, some temporal peace in this life because without that, their life is a life of despair. I meet people all the time that are continually filling their life up with, with nothing, hoping to find something that will give them a few minutes peace and joy and happiness. Well, it may not be drugs, it may not be alcohol, but any kind of pleasure that they can put upon themselves or they can gather to themselves anything to fill that life of despair that is down deep in them. Oh, my friend, today I've got something better than this life to fill that longing down in my soul. I've got a man named Jesus, amen, that showed me some kindness. I've got a man because the Father sent His Son because He cared for you and I. And for Christ's sake, he gave me a way to not to have a live a life of despair. Number two, as Mephibosheth was sought out by someone that loved him, someone that cared for him, and someone that wanted to show him some kindness by the grace of God, you and I were sought out by one who loved us, one who cared for us, and one that wanted to show us some kindness. And God loved us from, e from eternity past. God loved us. Eternity future, God's still going to love us. And God show us, saw us in our condition. God saw you and I as what were we? We were crippled in despair down in the land of Lodibar. And God saw us in that condition, and he was willing to do something that would help us. So someone that had showed Mephibosheth love, someone also showed you and I some kindness and some love. Now, I got saved as a young man, a young boy, but I want to tell you something. When I got saved, I wasn't looking for Jesus. I wasn't looking for him. You wasn't looking for Jesus when you got saved either. You say, preacher, I was look you was looking for something 
but you didn't know what you's looking for. Mephibosheth was looking for something, but he didn't know that he was looking for the king. Mephibosheth was searching for something that would help him in his despair, but he wasn't looking for the king. He wasn't looking for David to come and rescue him. Matter of fact, he feared David because of what he knew that he could do to him. But guess what? David found him. He heard about him and he found him. Friend, I'm so glad that Jesus heard about me, that he knew me before the foundation of the world. Jesus heard of me. And guess what? He found me. He found me where I was at. He found me in my lost condition. He found me in my helpless state. He found me in my crippled ruins, and he came to me. He found me in my sin, in my despair, and he had mercy upon me. He had grace upon me. God's grace is sufficient to save those that will come to him. If you're dead and out and you're down and out, down in the land of Lodabar, looking for something, I want to tell you something. Jesus is looking for you. He'll find you, amen. He'll call you. Now, something could have happened here. The servant that came to get Mephibosheth could have warned him ahead of time, and he said, well, I'm going to hide from the presence of the king. But the king still knew where he was at. Now, friends, you today, if you're lost without God, you may say, I'll hide from the king, I'll hide from Jesus, but he knows where you're at. You can go to the highest mountain. You can go to the deepest cave. You can go to the lowest part of the sea. And Jesus still knows where you're at. He'll find you. He'll seek you out. Now when he found him and he brought him before the king, and Mephibosheth lied, laid prostrate before the king, he laid there before him, and he said to him, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Mephibosheth said to David, he completely surrenders and yields himself to the king. What, a, what, a, what an act of grace. The day that the grace of God sought you and the grace of God found you and you bowed before the king and through the grace of God you told the Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm bound before you. Lord, you save me. You do what you will with me, but come into my life and save me, and it'll be by your grace. And God did it. Amen. Hallelujah. And no longer am I crippled and lame down in Lodabar. So Jesus found us. Jesus brought us out of our sin and our despair. Jesus saved us. And number three and last, now we sit at the king's table. Amen. Now we sit at the king's table. Hallelujah to God. I don't, listen, I don't have a lot down here in this earth, but I'm richer than anybody else. Amen. I go through this life, and, and I'm like most people. Amen. I get by, and, and uh, you know, I try to think of the future some, but I get by, and I know my God's going to take care of me no matter what. But guess what? Every day I pull up the king's table. Amen. Every morning I pull up to the king's table and say, I need something to eat, Father. And he gives me something to eat. Amen. Oh, y'all ought to be excited. But amen. You, you don't understand. Listen, we don't have to live in despair. Preacher, I've got problems. If anybody here don't have problems, raise your hand. I want to meet with you. I want to find out what I'm doing wrong. You say, preacher, I've got problems. Yeah, and God's got answers. But there's no reason we ought not to pull up to the king's table and slide our feet up under the king's table and say, God, will you feed me today? Now, he'll feed you. Ain't none of us in here going hungry. You tell it me that I'm not. Not at all am I going hungry. God supplies my need. But you know what's more important to that? When I pull up under the king's table, he gives me that bread that I need from heaven. Boy, that's good stuff. I like bread. You can tell I like bread. I'm glad God used it in his word to show us sustenance and show us what we needed 
to have from heaven. It's bread from heaven that I need and that you need. And every day of Mephibosheth's life, he pulled his feet up under the king's table and ate the bread of the king. Hallelujah. Every day of your life, if you don't do it, it's your own fault. If I don't do it, it's my own fault. But God makes a way for me to pull myself up under his table and eat of the king's bread daily. You know why? As David said, I'm going to treat him like one of my own sons. And Jesus says that I'm a child of the king. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I'm a child of the king. His royal blood now flows through my veins. Oh, my friend, I'm pulling my feet up under his table because of his grace, because he showed his grace to me. We sat at the king's table and feast daily upon his word and upon the bread from heaven. And because we're sitting in the king's palace because of the grace of an almighty God that loved us and wanted to show us some kindness for the sake of Christ, we enjoy all the possessions that God has for us. Amen. We enjoy all the things that God has for us. Why? Because all that God has, He bestows upon His children. Amen. I'm a rich man today. Right at the present moment, I don't have two dimes or nickels to rub together in my pocket. And I think I did see a couple of $1 bills in my billfold. I ain't got a lot of money, but I'm rich. Hallelujah to God. Amen. I'm not rich in worldly things, but I'm rich in the things of God. I'd rather have that than all the money the world's got to offer. Amen. This life is temporal. It is for a little while, and then it vanishes away. Life is a little while, then it's gone. But what I've got in heaven, friend, is going to last me for eternity. Because of Christ's sake, God extended His grace to me, and now I can sit at the king's table every day, and through all eternity, I have the possessions that God has, and through all eternity, I'll sit at the table of the Father. Amen. That makes me happy. Y'all look at me like, say, preacher, you actually believe all that? Yes, I do. Hallelujah. And if you don't, shame on you. If it don't excite you, shame on you. You got some problems, amen, if the thought of sitting at the king's table through all eternity doesn't excite you and doesn't stir you, amen. You need to get your heart right with the Lord because it stirs me. Listen, I'll tell you something. This world ain't long for existence. Young people, what you're going to do for the Lord, you better do it pretty quick. Old people, what you're going to do for the Lord, you better do it pretty quick. You better make up your mind, I'm going to serve the Lord. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to find you just in what you're doing. He's going to find you doing whatever it is. If you're serving the Lord, he's going to find you doing that. If you're diddling, daddling around in the world of sin, he's going to find you doing that. And I want to tell you something, it ain't going to be long. Now, when I was young, it was hard for me to, to think. When I, was, when I was Eli's age and when I was a teenager, you know what, I couldn't, I couldn't think of time ending. I couldn't think of the Lord coming. It wasn't in my mind. I couldn't think about that. Why? Because I was young and I was invincible. Nothing was going to stop me from doing what I wanted to do in life. That's what I thought. But let me tell you something. Young folks, you need to listen. You need to plan your life not around the world but around the things of God. You need to plan your life around what God wants for you and not what the world wants for you because it'll just get you into trouble and lead you to problems, I promise you. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. You need to get born again by the grace of God. You need to ask Him, Lord, have mercy on me a sinner. Lord, save me. And He will. If you're a child of God, most of all what you need is to follow in the footsteps of the Savior. You need, to, you need to follow His direction. You need to ask God for His direction in life. I've seen, you know, a lot, you know, people graduating from high school and people going on doing whatever. Whatever you do, young folks, you better do it in the will of God. Y'all listening to me, young people? Whatever you do, you better be in the will of God or you're going to wind up in trouble. And I talk to you as someone with experience. 
get out of the will of God, you're going to get in trouble. Follow the will of God and you'll never be happier. But preacher, the world's, the world's got so much for me to have fun at. The world's got a world of trouble for you. And what fun you have won't last long. But listen, the grace of God will carry you through any situation in life. I think I'd rather have Jesus, hadn't you? I'd rather have Jesus than what this world's got to offer. Young folks look at me and say, well, preacher, you're old. You've had your time to have your fun. I wish, I wish a thousand times over I'd use my time more wisely for the Lord. I wish a thousand times that I'd dedicated my life earlier to God and that I'd served Him more fervently those days of my life that I did not. I, I, listen, and if you live to be my age, if Jesus don't come back first, which I believe He is, but if you should live to be my age, you're going to look back. If you don't commit your life to the Lord now, you're going to look back and say, I wish I'd have listened to that preacher. And may my words ring true in your ears. You're better off serving the Lord than serving the world. Mephibosheth found himself at the king's table. Not at all what he had had planned just a few days earlier. Not at all what he thought would happen to him. But because he was willing to bow before the king, and that's what he did. Now Mephibosheth could have said, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't know what the story would have. I don't know how the story would have ended. But he did obeisance to the king, and, and the grace of the king fell upon him. And you don't have to listen to the word I'm saying today, but I want to tell you something. If you'll ask God for his grace, if you'll pull up your feet under his table every day and say, God, I want to live and serve you. I want to feast from your table. You'll be the much happier Christian. Salvation will mean much more to you if you'll feed from the king's table. Oh, my friend, today, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? Are you eating at the king's table? God's grace made it possible. But if we enjoy it, we've got to exercise.